Good morning, everyone. Anybody feeling like you're on an island? All right, so I, I, I don't know why, but this week I was feeling like I needed to be at the beach. And so I put a few now since slides with beach photos and got a little Caribbean music going on to, to set the theme. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Um, we're going to begin our worship service by uh, singing one of my favorite uh, um, hymns from the, our early 80s. This is Majesty. Let's stand together as we sing, and let's uh, just point our worship and attention toward God this morning. Majesty. Worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So Lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified. Their majesty, worship his majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority. Worship his majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Hey Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. Um, it is a joy to have uh, you all here worshiping here in person and, and online. And my confidence monitor is not working, and I don't know our phone number, but I guess I don't need our phone number uh, to tell you that if you are a guest with us, you can connect by going to www.westoak.org slash connect. That's not a phone number. That's a website, and I can remember that. I no longer can remember any number longer than four. Does anybody have that problem, you know, four digits? Um, you know, so, so phone numbers, yeah, I, I can barely remember my own phone number when you have to talk to them in places. Um, if you're in the building, you can do that online as well. But if you're visiting with us, you can also fill out a connection card uh, that you can get at either of our main entrances here. Um, it is a joy to be with each other. I, we're, we're not quite to where we're going to welcome each other with lots of touching and hugs. I, some of you have done that already. But would you just look to your neighbor to your left and wave at him and say hello Smile with your eyes and any other part of your body. Now turn to your other side and wave and say hello. And now everybody turn to the camera. They can't see you, but you, and you can't see them. But just for you know, everybody wave back there. Um, we <laughs> all right. That was, that was fun. All right, we're going to continue worshiping uh, this morning. Uh, we we introduced this song a few weeks ago. It's called Battle Belongs. And it's just a testimony that regardless of what's going on in the world, um, it's God who's fighting the battle, not us. We're just to be obedient um, to what he's called us to. Let's stand and continue in that spirit of worship.
I'm filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. 
cups overflowing, no weapon can harm me. I won't fear. Joy is refreshing, restores my soul. The voices sing this hallelujah.
be reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And join me in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the wisdom and encouragement we receive as we read and study your word. This passage from Hebrews 12 reminds us how important it is for us to focus on Jesus, the perfect role model for our lives. And thank you also, Father, for the blessing of the Holy Spirit and his counseling as we attempt to follow through in our lives an effort to do what Jesus would do. Also, please bless us as uh, Pastor James comes to, to bring the message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
But you have called me higher And you have called me deeper And I'll go where you will lead me, Lord You have called me higher Called me deeper, and I'll go where you lead me, Lord. You lead me. You lead me. Say that God, I will be yours all my life. And I will be yours, oh. And I will be yours for all my I will be yours, oh, I will be yours for all my life. I will be yours, and I will be yours, oh, and I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy. And I will be yours, oh. I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy light the path before me. Cause you have called me higher, and you have called me deeper. I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, and you have called me deeper. Call me higher, as you have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I go where you will lead me, Lord, where you lead me. You lead me, simple prayer this morning is that we would be open to your leading. We'd hear your spirit's call as it guides and directs each of us in our lives. Pray in your name. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you. Thanks, John and band, for great worship this morning. Well, we're concluding our series today about uh, frameworks. We've talked about the Bible. We've talked about God's will, and today we're going to talk about Christian spiritual maturity. And that sound, sound fancy, doesn't it? Well, let me, in a nutshell, tell you what this really means. Did you know that God's grace demands growth? God's grace demands growth. In other words, you are not meant to be like a newborn baby in your faith. God wants you and me to grow in our faith. We don't need to be in a spiritual crib crying all night for the rest of our lives. <laughs> we don't need to stick to formula when... What we really need is USDA prime ribeye. 
I see you rolling. I hear you cook a pretty mean brisket, by the way. I'll have to try that out pretty soon. God wants you and I to grow. He's created us for growth. So today I want to preach a message that hopefully will stir us to growth and maturity, maturing in our walk with Christ. If you have a copy of God's Word, I'd invite your attention to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 today. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. You can read out of the written copy or, uh, of course, pull it up on your phone. However, you can access that. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. This is the letter of Paul, words of Paul. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray together. God, we come before you today and we pray that your spirit would touch us and convict us and encourage us and move us towards that growth that you've created us for. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In the last chapter of the book of the entire Bible, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, Jesus says something three times that really has gotten my attention as of late. And it's pretty simple what Jesus says. He says it three times. He says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. And then he says, I'm coming very soon. I think he wants us to understand that he is coming quickly. And those words for me have hit a little differently recently Because I, and maybe you're feeling the same thing. It's definitely a tug or a a pull on my own heart to throw off those things that really in the long run are distractions or those things that keep us from maturing, from growing, from, from, from doing what God wants us to do. Those things that keep us from 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 the the things that keep us sidetracked. Are you feeling some things in your own life that keep you sidetracked? Jesus is saying, I'm coming soon. Therefore, there are some things that I feel convicted about in my life to just kind of throw away. In fact, let me give you two major distractions that hit a lot of believers today and a lot of churches that keep us from growing like we need to be growing and maturing like we need to mature. In fact, there are two main huge distractions among us right now. One of them is called the have-to system. You have to be like the macho man. Those of you who grew up in the 80s, probably know who the macho man is. He was a wrestler. Macho, right? You have to have it all together. The have to, this is a distraction in churches these days. The have to system is when either a pastor or a group in the church dictates how you have to do everything. The have to system. It's a system that makes you feel so sinful and guilty and ashamed because you didn't follow the have-tos. You ever been to a church service and you walk out and you just feel like, man, there was no grace there today. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like that was just, it was just all about how bad I am. Where's the grace? (laughs) That's the have-to system. There's an old-fashioned word for that. It's called legalism. My way or the highway instead of Jesus' way. That's a distraction that will keep you from maturing. There's another system. It's what I call the happy system. 
It caters to the selfie culture. The cell tower of Babel. We all are supposed to speak the same language. Everyone is supposed to just get along and be a good human. And it doesn't really matter about your sin as long as you feel happy about yourself. So here are the 15 ways that you can achieve total happiness. It's so happy. But there's no sin in that one. There's no grace in the other one. There's no sin in this system. (laughs) In fact, there's no Jesus in that system. It's just Jesus is a really, really good guy. But maybe there's something better that's going to come along to make us happy. But Jesus is coming back. Life is not about being guilty all the time, and it's not about being happy all the time. It's about being faithful all the time. So it's time we throw off these distractions that hinder us. Because we have a great Savior, by the way. And we have a great salvation. And so it's time to mature, to grow into the grace and into the will of God. So how do we do that? Well, that leads us to this text. We've been distracted by the have to and by the happy. How do we grow like Paul encourages us to do here? There's four things, four uh, applications of this text I want to give you today. And it's pretty cool because they all start with the letter E. So this sermon is brought to you by the letter E today. So here we go. Number one, energize your salvation. Paul says, work out your salvation. Now, before we go any further with that, let me tell you what that does not mean. He is not saying work for your salvation. Okay, you cannot do that. And get salvation. You can't work for it. It's not Jesus plus all these good things I did. Jesus plus the church. Jesus plus this. It is just Jesus. That's how you are saved. You come to Christ. And Christ alone. He saves you. So don't get distracted when you read this passage and say, well, is Paul saying we're supposed to work for our salvation? No, he's saying work out your salvation. Well, what does that mean, Pastor James? Glad you asked. Here it is. When he says work out your salvation, the the term that he's using there means something more like work down. Um, it's, It's a snowball that's going down a mountain that turns into an avalanche. It's a, it's a skier going all the way down the mountain. And if the skier falls down, he or she gets up and keeps on going. It means to go to the very end of it. Think of it like this. Let's suppose that you come into a great sum of money. Let's say you win the lottery. And by the way, it's 20% tithe off the lottery. Just saying. I think that's in the book of hesitation somewhere. Um, But anyway, let's say you come in, you win the lottery, you come into a great uh, many resources. What are you going to do with those resources? I'll tell you what I would do with them. Two things, invest them for future growth. And number two, I'd spend some of them. I wouldn't go out to a field and bury it. I wouldn't put it under the mattress. I use it. You work down that gift. You work it out. That's what Paul is talking about here. And just a little aside for just a minute. I've seen churches before and even church members over the years who are so afraid of using their gifts. In fact, I've had folks on, uh, not here, okay, but in other churches that I've served, like on finance committees, and they don't want to spend a dime because there might be a rainy day that comes along. I don't see a rainier day than this one. 
Have you looked at the news recently? <laughs> yes, yeah, some of you are like, no, I turned that stuff off. Well, if you're not watching the news, it hasn't changed much, let me tell you. We've got to do something instead of burying our gifts. It's like, just like Jesus said, it, if we bury our talents in the sand, you can never expect a return, ever. Those of you who have bowed the knee to Jesus, you have received a tremendous gift, haven't you? It's called salvation. You didn't earn it. You receive it. You don't deserve it. You receive it. So what are you doing with that gift? You don't stay a baby for a reason. Do you know that? My kids down here, I, I, um, I've been on my own this weekend. Um, Shannon went out of town to celebrate. Uh, all of her friends are uh, turning a special benchmark of an age. I won't tell you which one, but... Uh, She's been out of town, and everything it, it has gone pretty well this weekend, except my dog got sick this morning, and I dropped something in the commode that I had to fish out, but other than that, it's gone pretty well. But watching them, it's clear they have a gift of life. They're supposed to grow. I can't keep them babies. They are not created for that. <laughs> as much as I may want to some days, oh, I want to just cuddle with my baby. Can't do it. You have the gift of salvation. Those of you who have been born again, you have been born again to grow. Paul says, work out of that. Work that down to what it really means. You've been given the gift. Use the gift. You don't work for your salvation. It's a gift. You work salvation. You don't work for it. You work it out. C.S. Lewis, I've been reading a lot of him lately. He said it like this about this very verse. He said, there is human effort for sure here but there's divine enablement to get it done. That is exactly what it is. We're participating in the work of God, enabled by the Holy Spirit. That is better than the have-to system or the happy system can ever get. Working out of grace. That's wonderful. Energize. Energize. Number two, engage the gospel. Engage the gospel. Paul says, work out what? Your salvation. I just want to pause on that word salvation for a moment. Can we not conclude that that is one of the best words in human vocabulary? Salvation, it means rescue. It means deliverance. It means transformation. It means no condemnation in Christ anymore. Your salvation. So when Paul says work out of that, let me tell you exactly what that means. A lot of us are good at pointing out the immaturity in a brother or sister in Christ before we look at our own. Paul said it's your salvation. <laughs> work that out before you work everybody else's out. Am I making sense? See, some of us, we, we look and say, well, there's Pastor James up there. Hypothetical. I could do such a better job than he can. He is just, man, why'd we call this guy in the first place? I, 
I have more spirituality in my right arm than he has in his whole body. Now, that's one way of looking at it. There's another way, too. Man, I could never be as good as Pastor Jay or that person sitting next to me. And so we guilt ourselves. We, a lot of times we go, to the, we go to the ends of the spectrum, don't we? We either over-spiritualize or we just over-guilt ourselves. Let me tell you what the only benchmark for your life is. The only person you need to be comparing yourself to is Jesus Christ. Work out your salvation. You're saved. There's no need to compare and contrast yourself to every other believer out there. Look at Jesus, and you'll always see where you need to go. Always. You don't have to feel guilty because you're such a no-good failure as a believer, and that other person is so great. Believe me, that other person you're talking about has some problems too. You don't have to over-spiritualize yourself because, as Jesus said, a lot of times we're trying to remove the speck from the neighbor's eye, the little splinter, but we got a big old log sticking out of ours. Get that log out before you help with the splinter. Work out your salvation. Engage the gospel. The gospel is called the good news for a reason. It's because it's good. There's grace for the sinner. There's hope for the sinner. There's no condemnation in Christ. Engage the gospel. Number three, esteem the Lord. Esteem the Lord. That means hold his name up high. Paul says, work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Now, what kind of fear is Paul talking about here? What kind of trembling is he talking? Is this the kind of fear that, 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 that happens when you get so scared you're just running for your life? Ah! No, it's not that kind of fear. The Bible is not a Scooby-Doo episode, okay? It's not, not what it's meant to be. Fear and trembling has the idea here of reverence. Wow, I serve a great God. There's a great commentator by the name of William Barclay. He said it like this. He said, this is not a fear of what God is going to do to us. This is a fear of what we may do to him. In other words, our worship of God is not to be some sort of, sort of cold, dead formalism. You just come to church and read a few words and sing a few songs and okay, that's it. We walk out the door. No. Worship is a response to the grace of the God who created the whole entire universe yet died on the cross for you. Me. I come before that God reverence, quivering in my boots because he's such a good God. Not this God who's like Zeus with a lightning bolt who's going to strike me down. This is the God who died for me and wants me to grow. One of my favorite theologians, his name is A.W. Tozer, said it like this, the first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high view of God. Keep that high view of God. Never let that go. Worship is self-surrender. The Christian life is self-surrender, not gratifying the self. Because remember, when it comes right down to it, who does Paul say is doing all the work anyway? 
He says it in verse 13. When you surrender yourself to Christ with fear and trembling, you are putting yourself in a position of dying to yourself so that it's not you, but it's Christ who's doing the work. I can't think of hardly any better news than that. You want Christ in you doing something? I do. In fact, this is one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible, if you think about it. Because we say, well, pastor, do I really work out my salvation or is Christ doing the work? Yes, a ministry. This Christ who's, who's living in you. This is the Christ who's saying, I, I, I'm in you, and that's the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1. This is why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. He said, it ain't all about you, and it ain't you doing it all in the first place. You surrender yourself to me, you'll grow. You'll grow just like you should. Are you going to live as Christ and take his yoke on you? Or are you going to keep going in the have to or the happy, the guilt? Or are you going to run to grace? Number four, enrich one another. Enrich one another. This is how you grow. I love in in verse 12 how Paul encourages them to keep on working this even though he's not around. And that's the real test of faith, isn't it? The real test is looking like Jesus and walking like Jesus when nobody else is looking and when you don't have to. Yet we choose. We choose grace. Let me give you a quick illustration. A number of years ago, about 10, maybe more than that, um, as a part of my doctoral work at at Baylor that I was doing, we had a class project and uh, we were to go to Shreveport, Louisiana. And there's a group, a ministry there called Community Renewal. Um, I think it's still around, but anyway, it was started by a retired pastor. And this was his hometown, Shreveport. And he went back because Shreveport had grown extremely, um, it was bad, crime-ridden. And he didn't know what to do. But God gave him a little glimpse of a vision. And he had the audacity to begin on Saturday mornings. He would go into the worst neighborhoods of Shreveport and just start walking around talking to people. You say, man, that's crazy. Sounds crazy. But God put it on his heart, so he did it. And people began to recognize him, and he began to make friends. Every Saturday, they knew the, the, this white guy was going to come and talk to him. And he began out of this to develop friendships and relationships to a point where there were people actually who were believers who would begin to move into these neighborhoods not to be the helpers who were going to lift everybody out of whatever, but they were folks who are actually coming to live and work and be as Christ to their neighbors. Something incredible happened. We got to speak to some of these folks who moved in that were led by this retired preacher. Some of them... On a weekly basis, they would have the local drug dealer over for dinner. They would have kids over after school. They just began to make relationships. 
And there was something strange that began to happen. Did you know the crime rate in these areas, some of the worst areas in Shreveport, Louisiana, the crime rate dropped by 50%. Why is that? Why all of a sudden were people in these neighborhoods getting along with police? Was it a politician that did that? What is a, was it a program that did that? No. Was it Jesus that did that? Yes. If something like that were to happen in Austin, it's going to be Jesus who does it. That's what growing in your faith looks like. God, do you really want me to do that? Yes. Okay. But I'm too much of a failure, God. My grace is sufficient for you. God, I'm not like that person over there. I know. Work out your salvation. You really want me to do this? Yeah. I'll give you the power. And I'll work in you. Which gets us to this. This is my invitation for today. You can't work it out if you don't have it. You can't work it out if you don't have it. Have you come to Christ for salvation? Now, I'm not talking about you've been through a program You've gone to church a number of times. You believe some doctrines in your head, so you're good. No, I'm talking about you going before Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need grace. I want to be born all over, the, over again from the inside out. Have you done that? That's what we call being saved. <laughs> being saved means being rescued because you can't do it on your own. Are you tired of trying to be the king or the queen of your heart? I know somebody who can take up that space really well. His name is Jesus. You come to him and you say, God, forgive me. Come into my heart. I want you to be the king. And guess what he does? He comes in and his spirit, the living spirit of the living God, invades your heart and transforms you from the inside out. And you begin to grow. Transform. You can't work out your salvation if you don't have it. If you're not saved today, that's step one. Come to him. It's like his hand is reaching out to you. That's a gift. Will you grab on? He'll lift you out of the pit you're in, out of the cell you're in. He'll lift you out. And it's nothing that you have to do. It's not something that's being imposed or coerced on you. It's all grace. Will you come to Christ? And as you do, will you work out your salvation? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these beautiful words that you've given us in the letter to the Philippians. What a letter it is. It tells us about growing and maturing that we don't have to be distracted anymore by the guilt that we hold on to, that we try to enforce on others, and we don't have to be distracted by just trying to make our way to be happy all the time because, Lord, those two roads lead nowhere. They get nowhere. So we see today, God, that you are the way and the truth and the life. 
And I pray today, God, that the, if there's someone here today or someone watching on Facebook and they've never bowed the knee, they've, they've not been rescued, today would be the day they would come and say to you, Lord, forgive me, save me, use me. And I pray, Lord, today for those who maybe have are, are saved, have been Christians for some time, but they... Lord, they've, they, their hearts have grown cold. And commitment has grown dry because of the distractions. Some Christians, Lord, they still try to earn grace. Instead of being freed by it. Some, Lord, they they run away because they just want what everybody else in the world is seeking after. And everybody's seeking after health and wealth and prosperity and just trying to be happy. That doesn't work either. I pray for those believers who've gone far away or grown cold. Today would be the day they run back into your arms. Remember that old verse from John's epistle. If we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to get us back on that track. Help us today, Lord, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I pray this in Jesus' name. Now's the time for public response, invitation and response. You know, every time Jesus was teaching, especially among the crowds, he called for response publicly for people to follow him. We do the same here. In just a moment, when we stand and when we sing, I'm going to be down here at the front. I'll have my mic off. Nobody will hear our conversation. You could come and say, Pastor, this is what God has laid on my heart today. Or, Pastor, I want to join the church. Pastor, I want to be saved. Pastor, I want to be baptized. Or, Pastor, I've, I've, I've gone cold. My heart's cold towards God. I'm ready to recommit my life to him. Whatever God is leading you to do today, you can make that public. Or perhaps the, the, the work between you and God is very personal today. And you just, where you're at in your seat, you and God just need to do some business together today. This is the time to do that. So let's stand and let's sing together and respond as God leads. John? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? And long for heaven and home When Jesus sees my portion My constant friend is he His eyes on the sparrow And I know Ah. Uh-huh. 
I lose my doubts and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know. Watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because. I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, and I know he watches me. Thank you. I love that song. Love that song. Please be seated for just a moment. Remember, uh, our invitation is is open. Uh, it's not just a few minutes in a worship service, but feel free after church or um, at, at any point, really, to holler at us, say, Pastor James, this is what God's laying on my heart. If you're watching us online, you can uh, go to westoakwoods.com slash connect, and there's a form you can fill out there. If you want to uh, communicate with us as well, we'd be glad to hear from you. Um, okay, just a few announcements before we're dismissed today. First of all, right after uh, service has ended here in just a few moments, um, our worship ministry team is going to be meeting in here um, and meeting with John. So if you could give us about five or ten minutes at the conclusion of the service, we'll come back in here for that worship team if you're on that team or interested in it. And uh, you can meet with us. And then tonight, very special service at 6 o'clock, right back here in the uh, worship center. Um, we have our deacon ordination. And uh, we have some new deacons who have been elected uh, onto our deacon body. And one of the, the great privileges of my ministry is uh, uh, having these uh, ordination services. These have been really meaningful services, especially to me uh, over the years. And I look forward to uh, greatly to our service tonight. And so I invite you back at six o'clock as, um, as we worship God and commission um, our, new, our new deacons. Also, I do want to remind you that our Annie Armstrong missions offering continues, and I believe today's the last day for it. Am I correct? Through the end of the month. Okay, so our Easter offering's still going on, and we have a little video clip we want to do as a promotion for that. New Orleans East has been home for me since 1989. This has been a place that I've grew up in. I've grown to love over the course of my life. It's a high population of low-income families, a lot of single moms in the area, a lot of young people as well. You have a lot of kids actually growing up in this community, seeing drug use, seeing prostitution. So in our desire to plant in this community, we wanted to be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope. So we started offering Level Up Fitness Camp. We bring in outside coaches from different gyms. They come in and they take the kids for about an hour and just teach them basic general exercise. The church should be that place where people can go and not only get that spiritual connection, but also the resources for all other aspects of wellness. We use our fitness camp to teach our kids spiritual and biblical concepts. We introduce them to the church, help them continue to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, it allows churches like our church to continue to give back. We wouldn't be existent in this community if we didn't have partners and people pouring in. We're here to try to catch that kid at an early level and just teach them that if you get plugged in with Christ, you get plugged in with the church, Christ can take a broken person and restore them regardless of how broken you are or what state of life you're in. That's a 
really cool looking ministry. Um, and remember, your gifts um, support ministries like just like that one and, and many others um, around North America. Okay, would you, be, uh, would you stand and we'll uh, conclude our service today with prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for uh, this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we could gather here, not only in person, but also online and worship. And so we leave this place now committed, God, to working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that you are the one at work inside of us to do every good thing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Good to see everybody.